Hey, this is Brian Lambert, and you are listening to the Positive Psychology of Pop Music. Hey there, and welcome to a brand new episode of the Positive Psychology of Pop Music radio show and podcast. The conversation I'm sharing with you this week isn't just one of my favorite interviews of all time. It's one of the biggest highlights of my entire life. As a kid, I was obsessed with Kids Incorporated, the musical TV show that taught me many valuable life lessons, not the least of which being how we should all randomly burst out into songs about our feelings whenever possible. But as obsessed as I was with the entire show, it was the artist I'm talking to this week who would have the biggest impact on my life. Even bigger than Fergie. That's because I wanted to dress like Ryan Lambert. I wanted to sing like Ryan Lambert, and I totally copied his fantastic Ryan Lambert 80s hair. I still do, come to think about it. Ryan was also my very first boy crush, though I wouldn't realize that until several long years and very slow steps out of an incredibly deep closet. But it was all worth the wait, as I am stoked to share our chat about his new podcast, Squad cast, his ridiculously impressive plethora of pop culture knowledge, and his own kick-ass music. Before we get into the interview, though, I need to impress upon you the magic that was Ryan Lambert on Kids Incorporated, if you aren't already aware. With his take on Mike and the Mechanics, this is Ryan Lambert with All I Need is a Miracle. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Awesome. Doing well. Thanks for taking the time to chat with me. I've been a very big fan of yours way back since Kids Incorporated. Whoa, that's going way back there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were kind of my hair god. In fact, I still have an extra two inches on my head, probably because of you. So yes. thanks. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like to hear. I knew it. Like, you know, everyone always says like, oh, yeah, you copied all these people. I'm like, no, no, no. Go back. Go back. I was the first one. That hairstyle. <laughs> I think I created that thing. And then Johnny Depp like came along and ruined it for me, but uh, whatever. That guy. <laughs> that dude. <weird. laughs> no, I really like I had a picture from some mag I was like five and I had a picture from a magazine yeah. and I told my mom I was like this. <laughs> <laughs> I really funny. enjoyed Squadcast and I wanted to know how you and Andre got together to do that. We've been like hanging out because we have like some projects, you know, that we're working on together and, and we both kind of moved back to LA at the same time and but kind of been helping each other out and trying to figure out where we want to land back in the business or whatever. We we would be in the car or we like you know we used to hold these meetings at the 101 coffee shop in Hollywood here and we would just you know we would just talk for hours about you know our past and like oh remember this story remember this happened or whatever and then we realized why aren't we recording this this is a podcast so why don't we just grab like a Zoom and hit record wherever we are and see what happens. And people responded. It was great. Like a lot of these Monster Squad fans came out of the woodwork and kind of said, oh, my God, I'd love to hear more stories. And we were like, all right, well, so we kept going. But then I started to, like, talk to some people. I'm like, hey, I got a podcast. you want to come on? And, like, this girl, Anusha um, Hutton, she's a, she's a local Los Angeles-based artist, and I liked her work. She actually is a director, but, like, there's nothing to do with, you know, the past or, like, something that had happened to us in the 80s or whatever. We just had her on, and we got a bottle of wine, and, and it was great. So we started to have guests, and then it started to snowball into, like, one week would be a guest. The next month, we just do, like, just me and him in, you know, Andre's apartment, just yapping and drinking whiskey and just talking. And I don't know, people are responding. So it's fun. It's who doesn't like to just talk? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, clearly I do. So <laughs> there you go. See, yeah. everyone's got a podcast and it's a new medium and it's wonderful. And I, I encourage everyone to have their own podcast. Yeah, same here. I, I was actually just rambling about Madonna in my bedroom and then people started listening and what era of Madonna are we talking here? Because I've got a few stories. About oh, Madonna. I was hoping you would. Um, <laughs> 90s Madonna is my favorite, but uh, 80s, 90s to today. 90s Madonna. My first concert that my dad took me to was uh, Kiss. There was a few other concerts my dad took me to. I think he took me to see the Eagles once and Linda Ronstadt. And then I got to finally go to a concert with, like, a girl. And, like, we got dropped off at the Universal Amphitheater here in Hollywood. And we got to see Madonna. And it was the Like a Virgin tour. Ugh. It was her first it was her first tour. We were sitting in the second row and she was rolling around in her wedding gown and reached her hand out 
and I touched her. No way. It changed my entire existence. <laughs> you want to talk about the story of never washing your hand ever again? That was this is the story. It took forever for me to go home and like wash my hands. Like I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but the, the coolest thing about the story besides Madonna falling in love with me, <laughs> is that the opening act was the Beastie Boys. Oh. And it was before License to Ill even came out, so no one even knew who they were. I might have been the only kid at the show who bought the Beastie Boy t-shirt and not the Madonna t-shirt. <laughs> so, yeah, two things happened that night. I became a Beastie Boy, and Madonna fell in love with me. See, I've never gone from loving someone to hating them so much so quickly because I hate you now because I'll never have that moment. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you gotta go with the little things in life, you know? Well, did you guys play any Madonna on Kids Incorporated? I was trying to remember and I, I could not for the life of me. Mm, as far as I remember, no. I don't think they would let us do that. Or she she might not have let us do mm, that. Or, or Sire Records wouldn't let us do it. Or her publishing, whatever her publishing company was called, wouldn't let us, uh, probably wouldn't let us do it. I remember, because I always asked to do songs. And I, I didn't, you know, I was a kid. I didn't understand what they meant by you couldn't do it. Like I would say, oh, can I do this song? And, and they would say, no, we they won't let us. I'm like, what do you mean they won't let us? Let's just do it. <laughs> like I didn't understand publishing rights and whatever. But as I got a little older on the show, uh, I think it was, I don't know, maybe like third third season, my third season in, I asked if I could do With or Without You by U2. Mm. And they said, there's no way they're going to let us do this. And I begged. I said, just can you, I understood at that point. I'm like, can you just go ask them <laughs> if it'd be okay? Just this once. Like, just pay for it. Pay pay up the ass for it if you have to. <laughs> just, I want to I wanna do it. And they did that for me. They did, That was the one favor they ever did for me on that show was, they went and got the rights for me to do with or without you, awesome. and uh, I got to do it like solo on the street or whatever. It, was, it wasn't a big production number; it was just me and the camera and the song. And I mean, if you watch now, it's super cheesy. But Well, I was really curious because I've interviewed several of the cast members of the Mickey Mouse Club and was stunned that they chose all their songs. I mean, they really were given carte blanche. So I was curious as to how much of the songs you had asked for and then how many you did that you absolutely could not stand and just kind of had to. Most of the time, we didn't get to pick the songs at all. Like, you know, whatever with the Mickey Mouse Club. And they're like, whatever, hoity-toity. <laughs> we, weren't, we weren't as like, you know, high high end as those dudes. I do remember one song that I knew, I knew the song, but I didn't really understand the lyrics or anything like that. I mean, I understood the meaning of the lyrics, but I didn't understand the, the structure of the melody. It was kind of hard to sing because the person who originally did it is so, like, distinctive and uh, the way that they, like, come in, come in and out of chords with their vocals. I sang it fine in the recording studio. When it came time to actually do it on the show and the music came up, and we started recording, I didn't know the lyrics at all. <laughs> I literally didn't know how to lip sync to myself. I didn't understand. I forgot what I had done in the studio. So they kept cutting. Cut. Try it again. Finally, the producer came up to me. He's like, you don't know the song, do you? I'm like, I don't at all. <laughs> I don't even know how to fake it. He goes, what if we held up cue cards? I'm like, I guess. And he goes, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go to your dressing room we're going to break for lunch and you're going to go learn that song you're not going to eat lunch you can't have lunch until you learn that song he was really serious <laughs> slave drivers he was really serious and my mom even like tried to bring me a salad he was like no salad <laughs> so <laughs> to this day and believe me when we got back from lunch and started taping again i knew that get out of that song <laughs> to this day when i hear that song it just like sends me into like <laughs> convulsions, <laughs> like post-traumatic stress I, disorder. <laughs> yeah, yes. If I hear "Glory Days" by Bruce Springsteen, what? <laughs> I will like huddle in a corner, like, oh my god, oh my god, I know all the lyrics. I promise, I know all the lyrics, and I will <laughs> sing them out loud. And I will challenge people, like, I can sing this song all the way through. <laughs> so yeah, Bruce Springsteen's "Glory Days" just totally got me. It's such an easy song too, but 
the way that he sings it, it's not like right on the beats, and it's not like a typical, you know. So believe me, I have every appreciation for the boss <laughs> ever since. I have every record I listen to him constantly. He's one of my heroes. But um, that one song, Glory Days, I want to kill myself. <laughs> you know, I think I remember you singing that. So if it makes you feel better, none of the terror or shame was coming across on screen. So you sold <laughs> That's it. That's called acting. <laughs> <laughs> That was Bruce Springsteen with Glory Days, a song with very special memories and some potentially traumatic ones for the artists we're spotlighting on this week's episode of the Positive Psychology of Pop Music, the one and only Ryan Lambert. As Ryan and I continued our conversation on the legends of pop music, it took us to a battle that may certainly spur some heavy debate amongst our listeners. So you have to let me know what you guys think. Is Thriller really the best Michael Jackson album of all time? Who didn't like Michael Jackson? It was ridiculous. I, I was more of like an off the wall guy yeah. than the thriller guy. Uh, I think by thriller I was already like, eh. like I mean we all do that, beat it, all that stuff. But like nothing's like off the wall. I mean that's like some serious disco madness. That's some like badass. That's some badass of record right there. Thriller was like it was just so huge. I mean obviously it was just like the biggest thing ever. So, like, I always kind of, like, shied away from that stuff a little bit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, everyone loves that. I'm going to go over here. You mentioned Monster Squad a few minutes ago, and I've never seen that, I'm ashamed to say. Oh, rest. Good. Yeah. I'm Sorry. Glad. That's good. No, because usually, like, when I talk to someone and if I'm doing an interview or something, that's pretty much the focal point of the entire conversation is this thing that I did is 1986, you know? <laughs> right now, like, the Monsters Club, there's this blown up cult phenomenon. Yeah. And uh, we get to travel the country going to screenings and various Comic Cons and things like that and uh, seeing the fans out there that kind of accumulated over all these years and it sort of like brought the film up to cult status, which is incredible to, to see and kind of interesting. But at the same time, it's like, well, where were you in 1987 when it came out? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was supposed to be a huge hit. I mean, it had like all the elements. It had everything that you could ever want in like a kid's adventure film. Um, it was a little too scary for little little kids. And maybe not scary enough for, like, teenagers. Yeah. So there was a weird audience. There was, like, kind of this middle thing where, like, no one could figure out what to do with it. And uh, that's kind of what happened. But, man, go watch it. It's fun. Yeah, I kill a lot of monsters. It's fun. <laughs> Why do you think it, it has that cult status? It must be very weird because, you know, I didn't do anything remotely that rad when I was a teen. But of the things that I do yeah. remember doing, I can't imagine if I talked about them today and had to be reminded. Well, I think there's a huge um, – over the years, there's just become this m massive amount of nostalgic feelings towards things that happened mostly in the 80s. Yeah. You know, whether it's Ghostbusters or Monster Squad or The Goonies or E.T. or whatever. You know, that was an extremely special time for, like, children's adventure films. It was just an incredible time for, for that kind of blockbuster uh, adventure film. And <laughs> with the onset of, like, the Internet and everything... It's just become like this, you know, if you watch Stranger Things, right? I mean, yes, that's yes. a prime example of what, I mean, that's like the top of the list of things that like, that, that's it. It's all about nostalgic. They, they wear it right on their sleeve. They're not making any excuses for what they're doing. They are completely and totally paying homage to that era of film, down to the logo, <laughs> which yeah. is a Stephen King book, you know. Most of that stuff people don't realize because the Monster Squad wasn't that popular in the 80s and, and has only kind of grown in its nostalgic and cult status over the years, that Stranger Things is the Monster Squad. And it's kids fighting monsters. <laughs> That's what it is. It's not the Goonies. Everyone's like, oh, it's like the Goonies. It's like, um, Goonies fought an old lady <laughs> and, like, and, and saved, like, and got, like, a few jewels and saved, like, their little town. And no one else knew about it. Like, the Monster Squad fought 
fucking Dracula and saved the world. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, you you can go back and say, like, oh, it's like the Goonies. Change things like the Goonies. Or it's like E.T. It's like, uh... I don't know. Put, put, put Stranger Things and Monster Squad back to back, and there's a lot of similarities in there. So I have like a little bitterness, if you can see. <laughs> I can almost <laughs> feel it. Not, almost. That's not shining through at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hear a lot of Stand by Me. Like Stranger Things is so Stand by Me. I'm like, I don't know what Stand yeah. by Me you watched, but I don't remember Will Wheaton running away from demons and nothingness. But maybe I don't know. Exactly. Exact same thing. Yeah. It's all. Yeah. Watch the Monster Squad. You're like. This is a stranger thing. <laughs> okay, before you judge me too harshly, I did check out Monster Squad after my chat with Ryan, and it was everything I could have wanted and more. With Halloween and a brand new season of Stranger Things on the way, do yourself a favor and watch this perfect 80s gem of a film as soon as you can. Until then, allow me to play you the theme song from that film, from the very same person that gave us classic 80s track Maniac, to get you in the mood. With the theme from Monster Squad, this is Michael Cimbello with Rock Until You Drop. Well, I'm a little ashamed I haven't seen that, but I'm very proud that I followed you through Elephone all throughout college and actually just discovered the Canister album literally when I messaged you. It's funny, I just listened to that record because I'm putting together some music for the, a documentary that we're actually doing on the Monster Squad fans, and I thought, what better music to put in it than my own? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I've been going through a few of the records, but, um, you know, the making of that record was very tumultuous and, you know, like a family just fighting through to get to a finished product. Uh, we had a couple new members of the band, and we kind of went another direction where we let another person in who was actually going to be a co-singer and a co-writer of a lot of the music when usually it was just me and uh, my partner Terry and uh and it, so it was a little tough and she was you know she was she was a tough as nails girl you know she she didn't take it from anybody in her own band and uh, so that was a hard record to make uh, I think it came out okay. I think there's some good stuff in it. I think there's some terrible stuff in it. And I, and I think, it's, I don't know if it's a complete and whole product. Well, tell me a couple of tracks you like from Canister because I'm totally going to play some on the show and, and I don't want you to listen and go, oh, that will play the one song I can't stand. So. <laughs> <laughs> Day for Night is a great song. That's one I kind of wrote on my own. It's more of like a ballad kind of thing. What I was trying to evoke on this record was actually my love of film tell you the truth, hence the name Canister. Okay, I get it now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the song Day for Night is sort of um, a reflection on, well, there's a, it's a term, it's a film term. It means uh, you're shooting at nighttime, but it's going to look like daytime. So you're shooting day for night. But it also evokes like emotions, you know, I'm not going to go into exactly what those are, but um, it's sort of like, uh, you know, reflection of that night and day kind of feelings about either a person or a feeling or a situation. So, um, yeah, I go for day for night. You see me falling apart Cause that's not for days And I can't feel taught Shoot day for night I think Elton's best record is The Camera Behind the Camera Behind the Camera. Yeah. I think that's a solid record from beginning to end it's really cohesive and um i think there's some really great tracks on there i would have mixed it a little differently now that i go back and listen to it there's a lot of things i would change of course because that happens to everybody but i don't know that seems to be the most solid thing i've ever done musically the last song on that record is one that i just kind of tagged on it's just me and an acoustic guitar called something about fire which we always kind of like ended the set with, which I thought was really cool uh, when we played live. Basically just me and an acoustic guitar kind of sang like in a lower register, like, you know, getting my Johnny Cash on. <laughs> Run for your life. Run for your I was on TV and I'm in films and various other things, but you know, the thing that I actually set out to do was music. That's what Kids Incorporated was. I mean, when I auditioned for that, it was because it was a show 
about music. I only even got the audition because I had auditioned for uh, We Are the World, but for kids. So they got a bunch of, like, kid actors sing We Are the World, and then they needed actual singers <laughs> to be the chorus in the background. So whatever, there was Drew Barrymore, and she was, like, what, seven or eight years old or whatever, and she's singing. And then they had a bunch of other singers. And three of the kids that were the actual singers were on Kids Incorporated. Well, I got that audition. I got it. And the producers of that track said, this is great. You're going to have to get a haircut. And I said, why? And they said, well, you, we can't have a mohawk on this thing. This is like a children's program, a children's thing. And I said, well, no. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, well, well, you can't do it. And I was like, great, forget it. I don't care. But as I was walking out of the parking lot, this girl came up to me and she said, wow, that was crazy. You just turned down something. And I was like, I just, I'm not going to change my look because some guy wants me to sing We Are the World. I hate that song. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was just trying to, like, get an audition. And she says, look, there's a TV show that I'm on, and I want you to come audition for it because we need a new cast member. One of the cast members is leaving. Uh, she goes, I can't promise you anything, but just come down and see what, see what it's all about. And I went down, and, you know, I think like 10,000 kids later across the country, I got it. I was kids incorporated. So Martika saved me. Uh, I was wondering who it was. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was Martika. She came out of the parking lot and she said, I wanted you to come audition for Kids Incorporated. Wow. Thank you, Martika. See, you never know what decision will lead to the next path in your life. That's crazy. That's the thing. You just never know what's around the corner. Just never never give up and never, you know, don't underestimate yourself and, and stay true to yourself. That's like I always say, you know, just make sure you're happy. That's all. See, that's a very inspiring message, and it's hilarious that the We Are the World message should, in theory, be about acceptance of diversity, and yet we can't use you because of your hair. <laughs> right, right, right? I'm like, it was just so weird. As much fun as this interview has been, and good God it has been, the positive message Ryan shared about the importance of staying true to who you are is one of the concepts in positive psychology I feel the most strongly about. It certainly isn't always easy to do, but the energy it takes to go after opportunities that aren't a good fit for us is much more taxing, not to mention less rewarding, than the ones that are. And as Ryan demonstrated, sometimes just proudly being who you are will draw those opportunities to you in unexpected and life-changing ways. Ways. So to celebrate Ryan's integrity and authenticity, here's a very appropriate track from his Kids Incorporated days. With his take on a Kenny Loggins Footloose classic, this is Ryan Lambert with I'm Free. Well, uh, I want to end with another musical question because I heard that you're like a karaoke Jedi. <laughs> karaoke Jedi. Yeah. See, in my head, I am a karaoke master, and the rest of the world, unfortunately, would probably use very different adjectives to describe me. Um, <laughs> but if you had to pick three songs to take me down with, what would you pick? Well, first of all, my karaoke thing is this. When I go with friends to do karaoke, or I just find myself in a situation did not, and not knowing that I was in a room where karaoke was about to take place, there was a time when all my friends would be like, yeah, go do this, get up there and do this, eh. And I'd go, okay, I don't care. You know, I'm not, I have no problem being on stage and singing in front of people. <laughs> just, and I would say, just pick a song. And they go, what if you don't know it? And I'm like, well, then that's stupid, because then I'm just going to look like, who wants to watch that? Who wants to watch someone go to stage and go, I don't know what this song is? And like, okay, bye. So at least pick something you think I would know. So I always let someone else kind of pick it. And then I'd go, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess I'm doing, you know, Moving Out by Billy Joel, whatever. <laughs> Eventually, though, no one asked me to do it anymore. Because it's not fun when I get up and do it. Mm. It's kind of fun when, like, your friends get up that are scared to get up there and do it. Yeah. Or, like, can't sing for and you're just laughing at them. But when a guy gets up there that, like, does it professionally, it's like, oh, well, this is boring. Now I'm just watching a show. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I'm always – I'm kind of embarrassed now when I do karaoke. Like, it, it, it's not like I'm the greatest singer in the world. I mean, I can't get up and belt Whitney Houston for, to save my life. But there's a little bit of a performance person in me that goes, well, I'm on stage and I'm going to make this a, a thing. So now what I do is I pick a song that there's just no possible way – that I'm, I still might know it, but it's going to be so terrible <laughs> that there's no denying, there's, there's no reason for me to be up here doing this other than the fact that everyone else is doing the same thing and I'm not trying to, like, show off or anything. So I'll get up and do, like, 
the Freddy Krueger rap from DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> just something just ridiculous. <laughs> it just doesn't have anything to do with I'll do like Baby Got Back or something. You know, <laughs> if, I, if I get up there and do like Duran Duran, uh, View to a Kill, I'm going to murder it. I'm going to kill it. You know, it's going to be great. Me and my friend Andrew have had a View to a Kill off. <laughs> we're like, we're both going to do a View to a Kill and I'm going to destroy you. <laughs> and I always win. There's <laughs> no denying it. I'm always going to win. But if we did bust a move by a young MC, you know, <laughs> there's a chance that I'm going to lose my ass on this one. <laughs> and that makes it more fun for me. That makes it more fun for me. See, That's I was excited to learn the three songs that you enjoy, but now I'm more excited because I'm going to create my own Ryan Lambert's massive disaster karaoke list that I would like to see. So this is great. Thank you. You do that. And then when I'm in Florida, we'll go and we'll do uh karaoke and you can, uh, we'll have a, we'll have a karaoke battle and you can pick three songs that will make me look like a, an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that is a deal, my friend. <laughs> so I've made my list of songs I've chosen for Ryan to sing in our upcoming karaoke battle, but I'm not spoiling them here. Sorry, but I have to keep Ryan in suspense so he doesn't have time to prepare or the opportunity to back out. So until then, let's celebrate Ryan's current karaoke go-tos, two very different tracks that I'd love to hear him sing for very different reasons. This is Duran Duran with A View to a Kill and Young MC with Bust a Move. This here's a jam for all the fellas Try to do what those ladies tell us Get shot down cause you're overzealous Play hard to get females get jealous Okay smarty, go to a party Girls are scantily clad, it's showing body A chick walks by, you wish you could sex her But you're standing on the wall like you was Poindexter Next day's function If somebody wanted to check out Squadcast, then I highly recommend they do. How could they do that? It has a few places. It's on iTunes and uh, a few other places, SoundCloud. But um, mainly I tell people to go to ryanandandre.com. That is the Squadcast podcast website, and you can listen to it there. It's free. You can always check out my uh, my Twitter or my Instagram. I always encourage people to follow me on Instagram, which is my name, Ryan Lambert 111 and it's the same on Twitter, Ryan Lambert 111. Andre Gower is Andre Gower Official. Um, that's his um, Instagram, and you can find our, our podcast there. It's called Squadcast with Ryan and Andre, if you're looking it up on iTunes. And the other thing that people can see uh, me on is there's a show on Alpha. If you go to projectalpha.com, and you can sign up. It's, you can do a 30-day free trial, but I think it's only $4 a month. Um, I have a show called Short Ends with Andre as well. And we host a weekly show, and what we do is we show um, short films from around the world. And then we sort of curate these short films, and then we kind of talk about them in between. And uh, that's on the Nerdist Network. So if any of your listeners know about Nerdist, which I'm sure they do, we have that show. Alpha is a, a show on the Nerdist Network. So if you go to projectalpha.com, you can find it. It's called Short Ends, and it's all over our our uh, social media so you'll be able to find it there as well i definitely hope you'll check out ryan's website his social media and all of his upcoming projects chatting with him was an incredible not to mention hilarious honor and i want to thank him for taking the time to chat with me especially knowing how busy he is here's hoping he continues giving us a never-ending supply of inspiration and laughs through his work and speaking of never-ending that's a delightfully cheesy segue into the final ryan lambert kids incorporated gem i'm going to play remember you can head to the positive psychology of pop music.com for more episodes interviews and great music and remember to hit up the site and check out itunes when new episodes drop every wednesday thanks again to ryan lambert and to each of you for listening for the positive psychology of pop music i'm wesley ryan and singing one of my favorite 80s songs of all time this is ryan lambert with never ending story